and Paul. Very happy to see the pair of you back with us once again. Ah, well, it's been a beautiful day here. Uh, we're in our autumn weather, the hot weather that we've had, very, very hot weather, up to over 40 degrees through the summer and very, very dry. It's been a lovely day today. And uh, I'm just thrilled that we can study once again. So the uh, we didn't meet together last week. And the reason for that was because I was preparing this new series that uh, we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks. And we're going to be focusing on the day of the Lord. Now, that comes out throughout the Bible. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. And today we're going to have, this is kind of like a, an introductory uh, session uh, for it. We're going to be looking at uh, a broad sweep of what the Bible says the, the day of the Lord is. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at the New Testament. And in the next few weeks, we're going to be going uh, into the specifics of what the New Testament means to us as Christians, uh, sorry, what the day of the Lord means to us as Christians. Okay, we've got a lot of people coming on now, Eddie, Lennox, Vincent, we're so happy to have you here. Let us begin now with the Lord of prayer, uh, a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for your care, your protection. We thank you for our daily food and nourishment that we need. And we thank you now, Lord, for your holy word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you help us become more like Jesus every day of our lives. We're so thankful that we can study your word together. We ask that you open up our hearts and our minds so that we can know your will for us and be pleasing to you. Be with those that may not be able to join us here online. And maybe they'll be watching this later. We pray that you bless them. Be with each as they as they join us. Help us to, uh, to understand what the day of the Lord is and live our lives in a manner that is suitable for that. We thank you, Father, and we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, the phrase, the day of the Lord, is quite a common uh, expression that we can read in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But what does it mean? In the, in the religious world, it means many, many different things. And we're going to be looking at, in this study, some of the false ideas that come up from this idea of the day of the Lord, uh, just so that we can... We can uh, get rid of those false doctrines. You know, one of the things that uh, comes up often, and I hear it, I hear it almost every week, you know, that uh, things, things are going really bad in the world. Uh, there's wars and there's rumors of wars. Therefore, the day of the Lord must be very close. Well, you know, that's not exactly what, uh, it's not at all, I, what the day of the Lord is about. We're going to have a look at that. We're going to see the, the false idea of that. Uh, the Bible tells us on numerous occasions that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So there are no signs for that. In fact, we're told it will come just like in the days of Noah when people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, uh, they, they, they didn't know until it was too late when the flood came. So too 
will be the, the day of the Lord. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to the Old, Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah, and uh, we're going to have a look there in chapter 13 at... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll start looking at references to the day of the Lord. So we're in Isaiah uh, chapter 13 and verse 1. Okay. Let me see. Something's happening here. Okay. I'll try that again. Oh, I see what's, I see what's, what's going on. I see. Okay. I pressed the wrong button. Here we go. Okay. Now, I, I generally tell people not to worry too much about the, the headings that the publishers of the Bible gives us, but that, that's just a little bit of a hint. Notice, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, Amos saw, Lift up a standard on the bare hill. Raise your voice to them. Wave your hand that they, that they may enter the door of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones. I have even called my mighty warriors, my proud exalted ones, to execute my anger. Sound a, a trumpet, a, a tumult on the mountain like that of many people. Sound the uproar of the kingdoms, a nation gathered together. The Lord of hosts is mustering an army for battle. They're coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons. The Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt and they will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a women, woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment. Their, flame, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. Now, this is a very, very dramatic, even terrifying passage that we read here about the the state the future of the 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 empire of the babylonians we, we can see that starting there in verse one let's go back there an oracle concerning babylon which isaiah the son of Am, uh, amos saw now notice notice certain things here uh, sounded tumult on the mountains like that of many people, the sound of an uproar of the kingdom, the nations gather together, the Lord of hosts is mustering an army for battle. Uh, notice, this, the Lord and his instruments of desert, uh, indignation to destroy the whole land, wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Here we can see that this is a prophecy of the destruction of, of Babylon. You remember the, the history of the Jewish nation and Babylon, how that they would take the Israel was defeated by Babylon and they were taken away into the land of Babylon. Daniel was one of those who were taken away and, and he, he too prophesied about this and he actually lived through it he recorded the fact that the medo-persian empire overthrew the babylonian empire and you remember we studied uh, a few months ago uh, and we mentioned about the the temple that king that's uh, the statue that king nebuchadnezzar saw well this is a prophecy about that now the the point of this whole thing is that this is called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord here is a day of judgment and destruction. So we need, we need to keep that stuck in the, in the back of our head. We need to understand that that's what, what, at least in this passage, this is talking about. Now, 
Turn in your Bibles over to the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to have a, a read there. It's another, it's a similar prophecy, but about a different nation. Okay. Uh, Ezekiel, and we'll read uh, chapter 30, verses 1 to 3. Uh, the word of the Lord came again, saying to me, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, uh, Lord God, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a, a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt, and anguish will be with the Ethiopians. When the slain fall in Ethiopia, Ethiopia they take away her wealth, and the foundations are torn down. We'll, we'll, well, let's go on. Ethiopia, Put, Lud, and all Arabia, Libya, and all the people of the land that is in league will fall with them by the sword. You see, once again, we see this, this idea here in verse 3. I beg your pardon. Uh, in verse 3, for the day is near. Now, this day is another day. It's a different day from the day of the Lord for Babylon. This is the day of the Lord for, e for, for Egypt. It is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Okay, so we can see the pattern forming here. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. In this case, of the nation of Egypt, and a day of destruction. Well, let's move on. We're going to go down to uh, the book of Joel now. Go join with me. Go on, go on your uh, your your uh, Bibles to Joel chapter. Let me see chapter one, uh, and we'll we'll start in verse uh, fifteen. Let me see. 15. Okay. This looks just like the other passages. Alas for the uh, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and will come as destruction from the Almighty. Okay, now from what we've already studied, we can see that for someone that Joel is writing that there is soon going to be a day of judgment, a day of destruction. Well, let's go, let's go to chapter two. Now, all of these, all of these passages, you're going to have this in your notes that I'll send out uh, later uh, today. I encourage you to read these passages to get it in the full context. I try to get as much context as I can, but time doesn't allow me to go through the entire passage. But let's look at chapter two. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the dawn spreads over the mountains, so there will be a great and mighty people. There, there has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. A fire consumes before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like a garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like uh, and like war horses, so they run with a noise as of chariots. They lead from the tops of mountains, like the crackling of flame or fire consuming the stubble, like a mighty people arranged for battle. Before them, the people are in anguish. All faces turn pale. They run like mighty men. They climb the walls like soldiers. They each march in line, nor do they deviate from their paths. paths. They do not crowd each other. They march everyone in his path. When they burst through the defenses, 
They do not break ranks. They rush on the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. Before them, the earth quakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark. The stars lose their brightness. The Lord uttered his, utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. And who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend your hearts and your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness and relenting of evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave his blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion and consecrate a fast and proclaim, proclaim a solemn assembly. Well, if you haven't gathered it now, this mention of Zion, this mention of turning back to the Lord, a reminder that God is a gracious and compassionate God, the idea of return with me to all your heart points to one fact. This is the day of the Lord for Israel. Now notice verse one, blow a trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Thus Jerusalem was built on Mount Zion, the holy mountain. This is a prophecy concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and a pleading from the Lord that the day of the Lord is coming for you, my chosen people, because you have not been faithful. Repent and return. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment and of destruction. And it's very, very graphic here. Lord willing, uh, next week we're going to be studying specifically, uh, as part of our study, th this, this destruction of Jerusalem. And we can see uh, it, Joel's prophecy is, uh, is, is chilling in its accuracy and uh, its scope that it gives us. Okay, so we're going to leave the Old Testament there. We don't have time to go any f further. You, you can have a look deeper into this use of the day of the Lord. We're going to be looking now at the New Testament to see uh, uh, more about what the Bible says and what the day of the Lord is in the New Testament. So we're going to go to the book of Acts now, Acts chapter 2, uh, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll start, uh, we'll, we'll just at this stage read verse, verse 20, uh, and we'll notice the similarities of what, uh, what we've uh, been reading here. Verse 20 says, for the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. But notice, there's a slight difference here. And it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, if we are correct uh, in our reading, we will recognize that the day of the Lord is a day of judgment and destruction. However, verse 21 tells us those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Of course, we saw that in Joel there. Now, I want to go back to verse 14 to get uh, the context of this. This is very important. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. 
and it shall be in the last day, says the Lord, that I will pour forth my spirit upon all mankind. Your son and sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall she see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the skies above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to me. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs performed, performed through him in your midst, just as you know, this man you delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to get death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. You see, all of this is fulfilled at least in part by the death of Jesus Christ. Now, can you remember that when uh, Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom? This was a sign that that was the end of the Jewish age. But God was very patient with them because he waited until the year AD 70 for them to repent and to return. So that in verse 21, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, we're just going to go on quickly to a few more because we've got a lot, 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 of, uh, lot of things to do. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. Now, over there, we, if you remember, this is talking about that wicked Christian who was living with his with his father's wife. You can see there in verse uh, in verse uh, one, verse five says, "I've de decided to deliver to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus." Here we see. He's talking about judgment here, the day of the Lord Jesus. He wants this man to be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now we're going to go to uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 and verse 2. Well, let's go 1 and 2. Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will just will come like a thief in the night. Now, this is perhaps one of the most famous passages about the day of the Lord, that it's going to come suddenly at a time when we don't know, a time when we don't expect. The day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And like that, if we go over to Second Peter, uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burnt up. So we can see throughout the scriptures, we've noticed at least two things about the day of the Lord. It is a day of judgment and it is a day of destruction. Now, in the Old Testament era, this day was used as the day of judgment and destruction for many different peoples and many different times. The day of the Lord for Babylon was different from the day of the Lord from Egypt, which in turn was, in, was different from the day of the Lord in Jerusalem. But for us, there is a day, a day of the Lord in which there will be judgment and there will be destruction. We can see 
the, the, the scope of destruction here uh, in this, this passage. The, 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 the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and all its works will be, will be burnt up. That is the final destruction. Okay, now I want to want to uh, change tact here a little bit. Uh, we have a number of things that uh, I want to want to look at. Now, in many areas, the idea of the rapture maybe maybe you've heard of the rapture is very common. The idea that that Christians will be taken up to heaven suddenly and others will be left. I remember growing up as a, as a young man, I'd often see bumper stickers on the back of, back of cars, bumper stickers like this, which is really uh, quite ridiculous, really. This warning, in case of rapture, the vehicle will be unmanned. The, the idea was that that the Lord will come in such a way uh, and take up Christians and leave everyone else behind. Uh, and the doctrine of that also has, it has a, a number of quite, quite foolish and erroneous passages about it. Now, what I want, what I want to do now is I want to look at a couple of diagrams concerning. It's called the um, uh, the, the pre-tribulation doc, uh, doctrine. Now, let me get this. See if I can get this up for you. Can see now in this in this doctrine that a great many of the different denominations, a lot of people you know will be believe believing in this, that after the cross, there was the church age. At the end of the church age, the righteous dead will be raised. Uh, there will be seven years of tribulation. You can see that there. You're trying, trying to get some a uh, pointer on this. Uh, just bear, 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 bear with me for one second. Um... Okay. Let me see. Okay, good. That should work. Okay, yes. Here we go. Tribulation and the Antichrist will reign, will reign, and there will be a restoration of the Jews. The temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Then there will be a Christ will come again, will descend at the end of that seven years. That's when the kingdom will be established. The Battle of Armageddon will take place. The Antichrist will be established. The, king, uh, the, anti, uh, the Antichrist will be destroyed. The kingdom will be uh, established at this point. Okay, now, I want you to notice just here. It's at this time of the millennium, after the rapture, that this doctrine says the kingdom will be established. Now, keep that in mind. Let's look at what the Bible says about this. We're going to start in uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse uh, 17. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to prove, we, 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 we're studying about when the kingdom was established. So, so bear with me, because this is very important. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What he's saying, what he means by the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it means that it's close by, it's near, it's about to be established. 
He goes further in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Notice what he says there. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, that there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this very, very carefully, that Jesus made a prophecy that the kingdom would be established during the lifetime of those people who were there. There was some standing here who will not see death until they see the kingdom of God when it has come. Okay, so what the, uh, the, the, this, this, the doctrine of the rapture says is that, well, the Jews rejected Jesus and the kingdom was not established. Well, my friends, we've got a, we've got a major, major problem here. Notice, notice what Deuteronomy 18 says about a prophet who prophesies and his prophecy doesn't come true. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not sp spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. This is a sin. Jesus would be, would be proven to be a false prophet if this prophecy in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 did not come to being. No, we know that if Jesus told us this, the kingdom would be established during the lifetime of those people who were there. And, that, and of course, we would expect to see that in the scriptures. And of course, that's exactly what we see. Notice Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, the apostle Paul was transferred into the kingdom. The Colossians were transferred into the kingdom. We when we are rescued out of the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom. We, we, have, we have another example over here in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. Uh, 1 and verse 6, where John the Revelator says, and he made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. He, to him be the glory and dominion forever. John was in the kingdom. The kingdom was established, just like Jesus said. Look at, look at verse 9. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and the perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now the kingdom, the kingdom was established. Okay, so let's go back to this diagram we looked at before. Yeah, and I've, I've got, uh, now this, is, this, this next bit is from their own, uh, uh, own doctrine here. Now it's, it's simplified here. We see, when Jesus came, the first coming of Christ. And then the doctrine of this pre-tribulation dispensation, dispensationalism states that Christ is coming again for the church. This is the rapture. Then there'll be the tribulation. Then will be the second coming of Christ with the church. We'll all come back to earth and live with him for a thousand years when the kingdom has been established. But let's just talk about this rapture because this is where it all fits in. 
uh, well, it doesn't fit in. This is where it will all make sense what I'm talking about here. Let's go over to the proof text for the rapture. It's found in Matthew chapter 24. Okay, and we'll start in verse 40. Notice what it says here. Oh, we'll go, we'll go, let's go, let's go back. No, verse 40 to start with. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. This is where the idea of the rapture comes from and the only place where the idea of the rapture was. Now, now remember that bumper sticker that uh, I, I, I showed you. In the case of rapture, the vehicle will be unmanned. This is because one will be taken and the other will be left. Now, what you ask, I can hear you saying, what about the context? What, Keith, what is the context of this passage? We've studied this so many times. What is the context of this passage? Well, I'm glad you ask. That's what we all have to ask. Let's go back. Okay. Notice. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Well, hang on. Doesn't this sound just like the day of the Lord when no one knows, not even the angels, nor the Son, but the Father alone? For the, Son of, for the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. Verse 37, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until that day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 30. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and, the, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Now, the assumption of the doctrine of the rapture is that the faithful will be taken. But look very, very carefully at the context. The context is the same as in the days of Noah. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. See verse 38. But notice. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Who are the people who were taken in the days of Noah? Were, was it the righteous who were taken? Was it Noah and his family who were taken? Or was it the lost who were taken? Well, the context makes it very clear for us here. It's the lost who were taken. So verses 40 and 41, very far from being a proof text for the rapture, is talking about the lost will be taken. There'll be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. You don't want to be taken. Two women grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. My friends, you don't want to be taken. That is taken in judgment. We don't want that end for us. No, the day of the Lord is the day of judgment 
of destruction, but it also is the day of resurrection. We're going to be looking next week at more about this, and specifically we're going to be looking at the day of the resurrection. Okay, now, I made a video that goes hand in hand with this. So we're going to uh, go on to that. Now, if you have any questions, at this point, just put them down in the, in the uh, text comment uh, or be ready when, uh, um, when we're finished, where you'll be able to unmute and ask your questions. We're continuing on with our studies through the Bible. And with this video, we're starting a brand new series. Now, this series is entitled The Day of the Lord. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring just what the Bible says about the day of the Lord. There's a lot of confusion in the religious world today about what the Bible actually says. So our aim in this study is to try and demystify some of that. So what we're going to do in this study is we're going to look at how the phrase the day of the Lord is used both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, New Testament. and in the weeks to come, we'll be be uh, digging down further to see what the day of the Lord means to us now in the Christian age. So we're going to start way back in the book of Isaiah, and notice how the ancient writers use this phrase, the day of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 6, it says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Now we can see from the context of this passage, it's talking about the destruction of Babylon. Isaiah 13 verse 1 says, The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amoz saw. The first place that we're noticing here is that the day of the Lord is talking about a day of judgment. Let's now go over to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and say, Thus says the Lord, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will, it, will, it will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt, and anguish with, uh, will be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt and take, her, take away her wealth, and her foundations are torn down. Once again, we see this phrase, the day of the Lord, used in this passage. And it's talking about judgment coming upon Egypt. Judgment and destruction. And that's how we see the day of the Lord used in the Old Testament. It's used many times to talk about when great kingdoms were judged and destroyed and then fall. It even talks about this way about the nation of Israel as well. In the book of Joel, we read in chapter 2 there, this very same phrase prophesying the fall of the nation of Israel. Notice, Joel 2 verse 1, Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. This is a warning to the Jews. Jesus, the Messiah, was coming. And because of their rejection of Jesus, Jerusalem, which was built on Mount Zion, on the holy mountain would be destroyed. All of these messages were written as warnings to the people that they need to repent and follow God. Well, the same is true when we go into the, the New Testament. We see the same message given. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, as we read in verses 1 
through 3. We read this warning to us. Now, previously we've seen the warning to the, uh, the Babylonians, to the Egyptians, to the Jews. Now to Christians in the Christian age. Isaiah 5 verses 1 to 3. Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman uh, with child, and they will not escape. Here we read the day of the Lord is, a, is the day of judgment for the entire world. It's coming at a time when we do not know. Now, when the Bible talks about the day of the Lord in the New Testament, it refers to it for, for, it refers to three things that are going to happen. Firstly, there's going to be a universal resurrection. All the dead who have ever lived will be resurrected, and those who are alive on earth will be caught up in the air to, to meet the Lord. Then we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the second. There's the resurrection, then there's the, then there's the judgment. All will be judged before the judgment seat of Christ. And the third is destruction. All of these things are referred to as the day of the Lord in the New Testament. Finally, we're going to go to 1 Peter, and we're going to go to chapter 3 and read verses 10 and 11. Notice, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will destroy with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burnt up. Verse 11. Since these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. Once again, we say, see the same phrase, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. There's many people saying, oh, look, all the signs. Maybe the Lord is coming soon. There are no signs for the coming of the Lord. There is no signs for the day of the Lord. It's coming at a time when we do not expect it. Therefore, we have to be ready at all times. And we notice that this is the day of destruction. The very elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Finally, the Apostle Peter asks us a question. If these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought we, ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's the lesson we're going to leave with you, with me, with everyone we know that the day of the Lord is coming. What are we going to do about it? Are we just going to rest and wait for it to happen and be struck down? Or are we going to be ready, prepare for it, recognizing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings, and seek to serve him with all our life? If that's what we're doing, if that's what we seek, the day of the Lord has no fear for us because on that day we will be with the Lord forever. Well, we're going to be continuing on with this study, so join us next week. Thank you and goodbye. Okay, so there we go. Ah, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I can't see any questions on the on the on the text, but uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask your questions. Very happy to see that our brother Matthew from Uganda has uh, tuned in, and at the moment. Matthew looks very much like Dominic from Nairobi. I know <laughs> Dominic is currently in in Uganda uh, working with uh, with Matthew and the brethren. And clearly, yeah. they're on the road. Hello, brother. <laughs>
Uh, okay. Uh, so if there are no questions, that's fine. We're going to be continuing uh, next week on this. And then for, probably for the next three, maybe even four weeks, we're going to be looking at this. I've got a number of studies lined up. Okay, so we will then close in a word of prayer. So let us pray. The Father God in heaven, we thank you for your love and graciousness. We thank you that you care for us and watch over us and help us in all that we do. We ask that you watch over us, Lord. We pray that you be with Matthew and Dominic and the others that are traveling now. We pray that they would have good success in their work in the gospel. Be with Brother Greg Gay, who's there helping them, and we pray that you bless him and be with him while he's away from his family. Be with us all as we gather together tomorrow on the Lord's Day to, to worship you. We pray that our worship will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you very much for your attendance. I appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next week as we continue our study. So good night and goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>